Hey, hey, this is David, and this is going to be chapter 15. I know it's been a couple weeks since I last updated. My apologies. Chapter 15, A Starved Bird. This is Nancy Farmer, three-time Newbery Honor author, and the book is The House of the Scorpion. The days passed with unvarying sa sameness. Now Matt could no longer look forward to, Ma to Maria's visits. Both she and Amelia had been sent to a convent to turn them into proper young ladies. Maria's the one they're trying to tame, Celia said. Amelia is about as wild as a bowl of oatmeal. Matt asked Celia to send Maria a letter, but she refused. The nuns would only hand it over to Senor Mendoza, she said. Matt tried to imagine what she was doing, but he knew nothing about convents. Did she miss him? Had she forgotten him? Was she visiting Tom instead? Do you think Matt's jealous? Those are my own words. With Maria and Amelia gone, Benito and Stephen went elsewhere for their vacations. Mr. Alcaran was uh, away on frequent business trips, and Felicia and El Viejo stayed in their rooms. The halls and gardens were deserted. The servants still went about their duties, but their uh, voices were muted. The, the houses... The house was like a stage with all the actors missing. On the day, Matt ordered a safe horse from the stables and waited ten ten tensely to see whether the request would be denied. It wasn't, and Egypt uh, brought out the animal. Matt, uncomfortable, cast his eyes down. Few Egypts worked in the house, and he preferred not to think about them. He reached for the reins and glanced up. It was Rosa. Matt felt that the old thrill of terror as though he were still a small boy and she his jailer but this woman posed no threat at all the harder bitter lines of her face seemed unconnected with anything going on inside rosa gazed straight ahead with her hands outstretched it was unclear whether she was even she even saw him rosa matt said she looked at him do you wish another horse master the voice was the same but the old anger was gone no, this one is fine, Matt said. Rosa turned and shuffled back into the stables. Her movements were jerky and compared to what he remembered. Matt rode away from the house. The horse walked steadily. It would move in a straight line until Matt told it to go right or left, and it wouldn't pass the boundary implanted in its, in its brain. Like Rosa, Matt thought, for the first time he realized what a terrible thing it was to be in Egypt. He hadn't known any of the others before their operation they were simply there to do boring jobs but rosa had been a real uh, though cruel and violent person now she was merely a shadow of, uh, with the life sucked out of her on an impulse he turned the animal animal west rather than east and skirted the poppy fields to to where he thought celia's little house lay he shaded his eyes to make out its shape this part of the farm was an, at an early stage in the growing cycle. The plants were hardly ever more than a, a gray-green shadow, and a gentle mist waffled, waffled, waft up from the sprinklers in the ground. The air was sharp with a smell of wet dust. A few Egypts bent over the earth, tweezing up weeds and squishing bugs. This was their country, the country of the Egypts. Matt wondered what would happen if they suddenly woke up. Would they turn on him like the villagers in the movie about Frankenstein? But they wouldn't wake up. They couldn't. They'd, be on, they'd go on weeding until the foreman told them to stop. Matt couldn't find the little house. It must have been torn down when he and Celia moved. Sighing, he turned east toward the oasis in the mountains. When he got to the water the trough, Matt alight, alit, alight and filled it from the pump, as Tam Lin had always done. Drink, he told the horse. Obedient, it slurped up until Matt decided it had enough. Stop, he said. He led it into the shade and told it to wait. He felt a whisper of fear as he walked into the mountains. This time he was alone. This time, no one would come to his aid if he fell off a rock or was bitten by a rattlesnake. I would encourage everyone, if you're listening to me, go travel alone sometime. Go hiking alone sometimes. Have those experiences, you know. 
go do something by yourself out in nature. I used to live in Colorado and, and would go hiking by myself from time to time. Could I have ran into a bear? Yes. Could I have ran into a rattlesnake? Yes. Did those things ever happen? No. Do they happen? Yes. He got to the hole in the rock and climbed through. The pool was low since it was at the end of the dry season, and the thunderstorms of August and September were, were yet to come. The branches of a creosote bush trembled on the other side as some animal slunk into hiding. Wind, whist wind whistled through the bare rocks with a lonely, keening sound. Matt sat down and took out a sandwich. He didn't know what he was doing here. At the upper end of the little valley was the grapevine, sprawled over its man-made arbor. Someone had lived here long ago, and the vine, had, the vine had grown so heavy, part of the arbor had collapsed. Matt, Matt walked carefully into the, its shade, keeping his eyes peeled for snakes that also looked like the cool dark. He saw a large metal chest on the ground. On one side was a roll of blankets and a cache of water bottles. Matt halted. His heart started to gallop. He glanced over to see where the intruder was hiding. There was nothing except the keening wind and the rasping of a call of a cactus wren somewhere in the rocks. Matt retreated into the cover of a creosote bush. The oily leaves broke against his skin and released a pungent smell. Who had dared to invade his special place? Was it an illegal trying to reach the United States? Or had one of the Egypts woken up? As Matt considered the possibilities, he realized that no illegals uh, could have um, hauled a metal chest through the dry hills and canyons Celia had described, and no Egypt ever woke up. Heart thumping, Matt ventured from his hiding place and examined the chest. It was secured by two metal clasps. Carefully, he un undid the clasps and lifted the lid. On top of a neatly packed parcels was a note. Dear Matt, Aw, somebody knows. It began. Matt sat back in the dirt and breathed deeply to contain the shock. This stuff was for him. When he'd calmed down, he took up the note again. Dear Matt, it said, I'm a lousy rider, so this will be, won't be long. El Patron says I have to go with him. I can't do anything about it. I put supplies in this chest plus books. You never, you never know when you might need things. Your friend, Tamlin. Hmm. He wrote the word you, Y, you, and he wrote the word might, M I T E. Hmm. Oh, and he wrote the word dear Matt, it's D E E R. <laughs> dear Matt, it is said, it said, so dear is D E E R. I'm a lousy rider, so this won't be long, El Patron says. I have to go with him. I can't do anything about it. I put supplies, <sighs> totally missed that one. Supplies, he spelled it S-U-P-P-L-I-S-E, in this chest plus books. Chest. Anyway, you never know what when you might need things. Your friend, Tamlin. All right. It was written in a large, childish scrawl. It surprised Matt to see how poor the man's writing was. When, it, when his speech was so intelligent, Tamlin had said he had never been educated, and, and here the proof, what, proof of it. Matt eagerly unpacked the, ch the chest. He found beef jerky. Um, he found beef jerky, rice, um, beans, dried onions, and candy. Yum. He found a bottle of water purification pills, a first aid kit, a pocket knife, matches, and a lighter fluid. Pots and blankets, said another note halfway down. Matt immediately unwrapped the blankets and found a nest of cooking utensils and a, and a metal mug. At the bottom of the chest were books. One had a fold-out map and another was titled, A History of Opium. Two more were um, manuals on camping and survival. A note at the very bottom read, Keep Chest Closed. Closed is spelled C-L-O-S-S-E-D. Coyotes eat food. <laughs> Coyotes is spelled K-O-Y-O-T-E-S. Eat food. Books 2. So books 2 should be written, you know, 2 should be written T-O-O. -O. He wrote it T-O or T-U. 
Matt sat back and admired the treasures. Tamlin hadn't deserted him after all. He read and reread the last words of the note, and it was like drinking many cups of fresh, cool water. Your friend Tamlin. And your spelled Y-O-R. Then Matt picked up everything, stowed the chest in the shadows, and made his way back home. The house was, a, was in a turmoil when he got there. Hovercrafts landed. Servants ran to and fro. Matt found Celia waiting anxiously inside the apartment. Where have you been, mi vida? she cried. I, w- I was about to send out a search party. I've laid your suit on the bed. What happened? Why is everyone running around? No one told you? She distractedly pulled off his shirt and, and thrust a towel at him. Take a quick shower before you get dressed. El Viejo is dead. Wow. Celia hastily crossed her, herself and left. So she probably did this like the sign of the cross, I'm guessing. Matt stared at the towel as he collected his thoughts. The old man's death wasn't a surprise. He hadn't emerged from his room in months, and he uh, cleared. He'd clearly been very sick. Matt tried to feel sorry, but he he hardly knew the man. Matt sh- showered and dressed as rapidly as possible. I didn't um, tell you to wash your hair, uh, wailed Celia when she saw him. She she um, combed it down frantically. She was wearing a fine black dress with jet. Bi- beads sewn on the front and matt thought she looked strange without her apron el patron insisted insisted on us being present celia said as they hurried through the halls they came out of the out of the salon the the statues had been replaced by pots of flowers black crepe hung in swags around the walls and hundreds of holly candles glittered in a rack at, at one end of the room the smoke in the uh, pail of incense made matt break into a coughing fit Everyone, and there was at least 50 people in the salon, turned to frown at him. Celia handed him the inhaler she carried, she always carried. If you ever go to a funeral, it's always good to be quiet. Put your cell phone in manner mode, as my father likes to say. Um, You know, be quiet. Unless you're... Yeah. Presently, Matt's wheezing subsided, and he was able to look around the room. In the center was an elegantly carved coffin with brass handles. Inside, looking more like a starved bird than anything else, was Elphia Hill. He was dressed in a black suit, and his uh, sharp nose stuck up like a bead against the ivory silk lining. Celia wept softly, dabbing her eyes with a handkerchief, and Matt felt bad about that. He hated to see her cry. The mourners kept their distance from the coffin. They clustered against the walls and made low conversation. Matt saw Benito Stephen and Emilia Stephen. And Amelia, Stephen and Amelia were holding hands. The crowd thickened. McGregor entered, looking thirty years younger than the last time Matt had seen him. Now he really did look like Tom, and Matt felt an unreasoning surge of dislike. The hot, close smell of burning candles made his head swim. He wished he could go inside. On the far side of the house was a huge swimming pool that was hardly used by anyone except Felicia when she was uh, sober. Matt thought about the swimming pool now. With his cool blue depths, he imagined himself skimming along the bottom. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that pause. Don't say anything, whispered Celia in his ear. If she hadn't waked him up, she would have missed Maria's entrance on the far side of the salon. She was taller and thinner, and she looked very adult in her, in her slim black dress. Normally people wear, wear black. Uh, to a funeral, at least here in the U.S., and in, uh, I'm, I'm guessing in other places around the world, maybe. Um, her hair fell in a shiny veil over her shoulders. She wore diamond earrings and a small black hat trimmed with more diamonds. Matt thought she was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. She was holding hands with Tom. Ooh. Matt felt Celia grip his arm. He stared at Maria, uh, willing her to look at him willing her to, dr- to drop Tom's hand, or even better, push Tom away. Maria melted into the crowd without one glance, without once glancing Matt's way. El Patron was rolled into the salon by Tam Lin. Mr. Alcaran was with them, and for the first time, Matt saw signs of a real grief on someone's face. Mr. Alcaran went up to El Viejo's casket and kissed the old man on the forehead. El Patron looked annoyed and, and signaled Tam Lin to wheel him along the crowd so he could um, be greeted by, by people. 
Matt waited ten, 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 tensely. Tensely. That's a tough word for me. He wanted to des- desperately to thank Tam Lin, but now was obvious a bad time. Obviously a bad time. Somehow Matt knew the content of the metal chest was forbidden. He didn't want to get Tam Lin into trouble, but everything stopped when a door opened and the official priest entered. He was followed by a boy swinging balls of fuming incense and a children's choir. The sweet voices still the, the sweet voices stilled the conversation in the salon. Uh, they were dressed in white robes like a troop of angels. Their hair was neatly combed and their faces scrubbed and shining. They were all about seven years old and they were all Egypts. Oh, that's awful. The Catholic Church has Egypts. Matt could tell by the empty look in their in their eyes. They sang beautifully. No one was more able to appreciate good music than Matt, but they didn't understand what they were singing. The children took up their station at the, at the head of the casket. Stay, said the priest in a, in a low voice. Oh, stay. Matt had even seen priest had never seen a priest except on TV. So he went to a small church a mile away through the poppy fields. She walked there early on Sunday mornings along with a few other servants. She wasn't allowed to eat or drink coffee before setting out, which was a great hardship for her. It would be a great hardship for me too if I couldn't drink coffee. But she never missed a service. She never took Matt along either. Be still, said the priest to the children's choir. They fell silent at once. He intoned a prayer and ended it by sprinkling holy water in El Viejo. It didn't eat holes in Viejo's suit. The, the the way flying objects, the way flying priests, holy water ate through demons on TV. Matt had the vague idea it was something like acid. Let us remember the life of our companion, the priest said in a deep, impressive voice. He he beckoned on the audience, but no one responded. Finally, Mr. Alcaran said a few words, and then the priest told everyone to file past to say their final goodbyes. Matt looked up at Celia, hoping they would, they they could go now. She seemed grim, grimly determined. She uh, pushed him, him ahead as they joined the long line of mourners, shuffling past the casket. What am I supposed to do now, Matt thought. He tried to see what other people were doing when they reached the casket, most merely nodded and, and hurried out of the salon. When Matt and Celia arrived, Celia crossed herself, the sign of the cross, and murmured, May God be merciful to you. Uh, Matt felt a hand clap down on his shoulder and pull him out of the line. What is this? growled the priest. He was a lot bigger close up than he was at a distance. El Patron wanted to come, Celia said. This does not belong here. The priest thundered. This unbaptized limb of Satan has no right to make a mockery of this rite. And rite is spelled R-I-T-E. Would you bring a dog to church? The people in line had had halted. Their eyes glittered with malice. Please ask El Patron, begged Celia. Matt couldn't see why she wanted to argue. They weren't going to win, and he couldn't bear all those eyes watching him be humiliated. He looked around desperately, but El Patron had already gone. St. Francis um, would take a dog to church, Maria said in a clear, high voice. Where had she come from? Matt turned to find her right behind him. She was even more beautiful close up. St. Francis took a wolf to church, she said. He loved all animals. Now they're calling Matt an animal. Maria, groaned Amelia. She wasn't far behind. Dada will have a fit when he finds out what you're doing. St. Francis preached to a wolf and told him not to eat lambs, Maria went on, ignoring Emilia. Miss Mendoza, said the priest, speaking much more respectfully than he had to Cecilia, I'm sure your father likes to express your opinions, but believe me, I'm an expert in these matters. St. Francis spoke to the wolf outside the church. Then I shall too, Maria said haughtily. She took Matt's hand and led him back uh, along the line of the mourners. You're going to be in big trouble when Dada finds out, called Amelia. Be sure and tell him, retorted Maria. Matt was in a kind of daze. Celia hadn't come with them. He was all alone with Maria, being pulled through the halls to to some place she'd decided was safe. He was aware only of the soft warmth of her hand and the spicy perfume she was wearing. It wasn't until they were inside the door 
with the door closed that Matt realized they were in the music room. Maria pulled off her hat and ran her fingers through her hair, and suddenly she looked like a little girl again. It's so hot, she complained. I don't know why El Patron doesn't allow air conditioning. He wants everything to be like his old village, Matt said. He could hardly believe his good luck. Maria was here and with him. Then why doesn't he import rats and cockroaches too? From what I hear, his village was covered with them. He only wanted the good things from it, said Matt, trying to pull himself out of his daze. Oh, let's not waste our time with that, cried Maria, throwing her arms around him and giving him a big kiss. There, that shows I for, I've forgiven you. Gosh, I've missed you. You know, hugging somebody and giving him a kiss, that's always a good thing. You have? Matt tried to kiss her back, but she's You have? Matt tried to kiss her back. She slid out of the, his arms. Then why did you avoid me after the hospital? He'd, he'd done it. He reminded her of McGregor's clone. It was a shock, Maria said, growing solemn. I knew I didn't want to tell you. Knew what? Hey, is, is that people in the hall? Matt heard the noise outside as well. He pulled Maria to the closet pressed the hidden switch and heard her gasp as the secret passageway opened. It's like a spy novel, she whispered. As he drew her inside, Matt closed the door and found the flashlight he kept by the entrance. They tiptoed along the passage with Matt in the lead. Finally, he allowed her to stop and catch her breath. Hey guys, if you've enjoyed this uh, reading, um, give me a like, give me a thumbs up. I hope you follow me. Um, sorry for not updating here recently. Uh, I do typically post a new video every Friday. So hope you guys uh, have a, a good December. Happy holidays and all that fun stuff. And uh, stay safe out there.